Okay, so here we go on on some of the major crises of of the um, high middle or of the later Middle Ages, um, that period of time right before the Renaissance. This is what we're going to be talking about because these crises were were disastrous. They were monumental, and they had a profound impact that is we are still trying to measure today. Um, it's such a profound impact that that it inaugurated immense change throughout uh, Western societies, and so um, we're going to be talking about primarily the Hundred Years' War and and the Black Black Plague. Okay, so just to give you uh, kind of some background on what we're talking about when we talk about the, the Black Death. Sorry, not the Black Plague. I think I said the Black Plague um, in the pri previous slide, which you, sometimes you'll see it called that. But for the most part, this period we're talking about, there were cycles of plague throughout uh, Western history. This one in particular is called the Black Death precisely because it was so widespread and so devastating. And so we distinguish this particular plague cycle by calling it the Black Death. That, that's the signal that this, this is a big event. This is a very big event. So the Black Death transformed the West. Uh, it, it devastated populations. It really decimated them. If you're familiar with the the etymology of that word decimate um, this was truly a decimating event and it really wrought a lot of havoc on social and economic structures throughout the West so the Black Death originated um, around 1346 1347 depending on what scholar uh, you listen to uh, but it, it's generally agreed uh, that it originated near the province of Kaffa in northern Turkey. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we have this interesting event in, in which there is a struggle between some merchants and uh, the people, some of the people from the city, and they come into conflict together, and this leads to the transmission of this disease. And so... Um, a, the interesting thing to note about Kaffa is that it borders the Black Sea, and so it was on a, a pretty um, it was on a trade route that was that was uh, fairly well traveled, and and was pretty instrumental in in the trade of the era. Uh, the Black Plague, it's, the Black Death itself, this first virulent cycle, ended rather abruptly in 1350 A.D. It just exhausted itself. Um, and so, just to kind of give you the backstory of what was going on in Kaffa, we in in Kaffa in 1346-1347, we had some uh, merchant vessels that traveled to Messina in Sicily to unload cargo. Um, they had come from Kaffa. Uh, these merchants they were escaping some conflict with with the with Turkish official officials in that city, and as they fled. This conflict, um, they actually brought with them some rats. And by the time they arrived in Sicily, it was already apparent that these people were sick. And several ports had denied them access. Um, and so they just happened to arrive on Sicily and were able to just kind of offload some cargo and in turn offload some, some infected rats. Now, we, we do know now that it's not necessarily the rats that spread the disease, it's more like the fleas. The fleas were infected, they infected the rats, the fleas got on humans, they bit the humans, and they trans transmitted the disease. Um, a healthy flea bit a rat. I mean, you can see where this is going, that there was this symbiotic relationship between rats, fleas, and uh, human populations in the sense that uh, we had this perfect storm for spreading disease that occurred. <clears throat> now the the epidemic itself was estimated to have killed around a third of Europe's population. Now think about that. Think about um, a similar plague here in the United States, what that would mean for our population. It would be devastating. Um, so if if the state of Idaho has about a million and a half people, 
that means that 500,000 people in the state of Idaho would be dead. So that's a tremendous that's a tremendous loss of life, one third of the population. And that you know again that that estimate that estimate varies depending on what scholar you talk to. Some scholars um, think maybe it was more along the lines of 20, 25 percent, but other scholars think it might have been worse. And the plague, the pla this this particular plague, uh, it very much depended on the population itself as to how virulent it was. Some some cities uh, escaped with with no cases of of plague, but others were almost wiped out. So there was a lot of a lot of variability. So it's clear that in some areas it was more deadly than others. So when we say a third of the population, what we really mean is that some cities got away with no deaths, while others um, accounted for a large portion of that death. So for example, in Venice, which was a major trading city, <clears throat> there are excellent records from the time period. <clears throat> and we know from those records that 60% of the residents of Venice died within 18 months of the first infection. That is 500 to 600 people a day at its height. Now think about the um, overwhelming burden that places on, on the political and social structure of the city. Uh, what that does to people and having to deal with such enormous amounts of ill, enormous numbers of dead, I, what do you even do with the bodies? Uh, Florence, on the other hand, um, they suffered on a more they suffered on an even wider scale. Uh, some estimates go as high as seventy five percent in a single year. So uh, at the height, about seventy five percent of their population died. It's crazy. It's so hard to fathom that that incredible loss of life. So you can imagine that as a result of this, um, there's some tremendous repercussions. Now, one of the things that we know and and we suspect is that one of the reasons that uh, the black the Black Death was so deadly is that you know we discussed in the last lecture that there was this great famine and so we know that we have a weakened we had a weakened population during this time many people had come through the great famine they were not doing well health wise anyway and so those areas that were particularly hard hit were probably more vulnerable to the black death and and probably uh, suffered larger numbers as a result of having been weakened by the black death so there's an important aspect to um, to the Black Death in terms of the context, the context of what's going on and, and why it, it became so deadly. And it's important to realize that. And and I say that because just, just as we know that the Great Famine contributed to uh, a, greater vulnerable, a, a greater vulnerability um, to this disease, we know that the de disease in turn um, let, had some had some rather um, unanticipated effects. So let's talk about some of those effects. Politically, uh, during the height of the famine, councils, courts, and parliaments were adjourned temporarily, so the business of government kind of came to a stop. This meant that disputes couldn't be resolved quickly by word of law, and wills couldn't be collected. Now think about that, wills. I, you you a will goes into effect when you have somebody who has died but we have massive nor we have massive amounts of death and the 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 governments could not handle them the the local governments just couldn't cope and so all of this kind of comes to a stop even bankers no longer received their payments from debtors and no immediate kin could accept the financial burden the uh, Hundred Years War, and we're going to talk more about that, but the Hundred Years War between England and France was actually suspended due to innumerable deaths. Even royalty weren't spared. The King of Castile, Alfonso XI, uh, died in the epidemic, and the wife of Peter IV of Aragon also fell victim. So it, it cut across uh, social, um, social status, class, um, 
And where you lived was no guarantee, even. How healthy you were was no guarantee. Now, some of the economic impacts. The bubonic plague um, caused the destruction of a decentralized system of government in the medieval era. Uh, this method of power control gave everyone their defined place in society, and it provided each with their basic needs. And so we've talked about this as being uh, very loosely what we call feudalism. Um, and so feudalism provided this, this structure, and it varied from region to region. Feudalism didn't look the same from one city to the next, but still it, it provided the structure and it gave people a certain expectation um, about how their basic needs were going to be met, how they were going to be safe, how they were going to be secure. Uh, the economy suffered greatly with a labor shortage. Massive death, you don't have laborers. And so wages rose rapidly as a result. And you might think that this is a good thing, but we're going to see that it has unintended consequences. In particular, skilled workers were in demand, and they could receive huge profits for their ability in a given trade. Guildsmen such as crafters and blacksmiths were barely existent after the Black Death. Um, and so you can imagine... Uh, the loss of, of just um, occupational knowledge that occurred as a result of the Black Death. There was an, all, an oversupply of goods because you don't have as many people consuming and the high mortality rate meant the prices lifted significantly. So we have an oversupply, we have high prices, we also have farms and entire villages that were abandoned and there was a shift of workers from the rural countryside to urban areas. Now this means that there is less labor being applied to agricultural to the to the uh, the agricultural pursuits of a of a of a local economy. So n not as many laborers involved in the production of food. So consequently as there's an imbalance in agricultural employment that occurred. Uh, in addition, construction projects were frozen. So a lot of buildings from this time were just, you, you know, left. They were left unsupervised. Unsupervised. They were left unfunded. Um, projects didn't get completed. Now, some of the repercussions for um, culture and religion, um, as you can imagine, because of the nature of living space at schools and universities, these were institutions that were hit the hardest. So for an example, 16 of the 40 professors at Cambridge University in England died in, in the Black Death. That's a lot. Uh, that's almost half. And priests and doctors were often involved with the diagnosis and burial of infected people, so they were by far much more at risk. We see larger numbers, we see lots of death among these populations because they came in contact frequently with those who were infected. Bishops soon became deceased and, and often died with no successors, so there's an interruption in the church hierarchy. Whole communities of nobles and general families were wiped out with no heirs to land. So we have a lot of unclaimed land and no one knows what to do with it. Certain professions such as the friars took generations to recover from this and and often they didn't recover late into the 15th, even the 16th century. The Black Death led to many people questioning God. You know, for example, why would why would God do such a dreadful thing? Why would he let this happen? This is something that people asked. Some people lost faith, while others strengthened their faith. It's, it's really interesting how you have these different responses to this catastrophe. But there really is no denying the fact that Europe no longer believed in the power and unity of the Catholic Church. Now think about this, because the Catholic Church for centuries has been the structure for religious identity, for, religi for establishing doctrine, theology, practice. This is the institution that people look to to provide for the salvation of people's souls. And as people are questioning God, they're questioning everything about, about the church. Um, and so you can imagine what a disruptive influence this was on society and its cohesiveness. Now everyone <clears throat> slowly 
started uh, to realize that corruption was present throughout the hierarchy. Like I said, as, as people are questioning God, questioning the church, they're starting to look at what's going on in the church and they're starting to see, you know, while in the past uh, there were calls for reform and calls to get rid of corruption out of the church, now people are looking at it and they're saying, the church is corrupt, God is displeased, we must do something. Um, the, God must want something different. And so, as you can imagine, as people are asking these questions, this is the 14th century when this has happened, and when is, this is happening. We are not that far away from the Protestant Reformation. And so, these questions that people are asking about the nature of God, uh, why, does, why is God allowing this to happen? What's wrong with the church? It's going to have a profound impact on the course of events that led to the, Pro the Protestant Reformation and in determining how the Protestant Reformation is going to play out. So by 1517, uh, we have Martin Luther uh, nailing his 95 Theses to the door and calling for reform. And when that happens, Protestant Reformation just spreads like wildfire. It's really amazing for a society that didn't have radio, didn't have telephone, didn't have any kinds of really efficient means of communication. It's amazing how you have Luther coming up with these reforms, with these 95 theses, and within a couple of weeks these ideas have spread from one end of Europe to the next, to the other. So really tremendous how quickly this takes off. Uh, it really spreads like wildfire. So some of the artistic changes that we see, um, this is going to have an impact on the development of the Renaissance as well. Um, now art uh, changes profoundly I, with the Black Death. Uh, you, art becomes very dark. There's an obsession with these really dark images. Uh, you see lots of, lots of demons and just really kind of scary imagery. Um, people were putting their fears and their worries into art. And so we see the depiction of this horrible plague bringing, uh, and, and what it does is it brings imagery that is really just grim brutality to these paintings during the Middle Ages. And it's, it's such a prevalent genre that we call, we, we even have a name for some of these images. For example, there's the danse macabre style of brushwork. And what you often see in this style of painting is you'll often see skeletons depicted in daily scenes. So they're often interacting with others. Um, they might be dancing with others. They, I, you know, they're interacting with, sometimes they're interacting just with ske other skeletons, but sometimes they're interacting with other people, with, with other living people. So... What what scholars kind of think now is that these skeletons were a representation of death, and or or perhaps even a symbol of the desperation and fear that people were experiencing, and and so you know it, it reflects this feeling that disaster and death was right around the corner, that that it could happen at any time. And some institutions like churches even hung these paintings on walls and easels. It really soon became common to see strange elements being incorporated into pictures. Tomb sculpture, uh, sculptures that you found on tombs often showed a rotten decomposing body dressed in rags with worms burrowing through the flesh. Now, think about this, because I, I showed you an image in another lecture, I believe it was in the early, the early Middle Ages lecture, of Eleanor of Aquitaine and her husband Henry, and you have these very pious images. They're, and, and really, they look, they look at peace, they're in repose, they look like they've gone to God, and, and so there's definitely a different image being conveyed here. We've gone from these images... We, we've gone from these sculptures that are intended to, to depict the dead as being pious individuals headed to heaven. Um, we've, they've been replaced 
with images of just death, corruption and death, just rotten, gross. I it's really some of these images are really really disturbing and stuff of nightmares. Um so you don't so much see uh, sculptures, tomb sculptures of people clothed in things like elegant armor or beautiful clothing, resting in really beautifully decorated coffins. These are very different, and and so we see a lot of new techniques um, being employed in in the creation of these tombs. So uh, this map gives you an idea of how of how the uh, Black Death spread. So you can see on the right. The, the city of Kaffa with that dark that dark line and this this map here assumes that the Black Death uh, spread in 1347 and really 1347 is probably the year that you want to think of as being um, the tipping point for Europe so it it has reached Kaffa from Asia Asia of course keep in mind that Asia has not been immune to this. They the plague hit them even earlier, and there's been tremendous loss of life in in Asia as well. And and as you can see from this map, it it spread to parts of Africa also. So this is much more widespread than just these parts of Europe. This is this is a world plague. Um, so in 1347, if you look at this map, you can see where it's arrived at Kaffa, and it it kind of came in on some of these trade routes. And uh, if you just take a look at it, you can see sort of the waves that occurred as this disease spread. So um, in, in the, the next darkest color, I guess you could say, you see those around Sardinia, Sicily, um, the, uh, the western portions of the Ottoman Empire. These are areas where some of those, those merchant ships visited. And as they visited, they were spreading this disease. And so this is why you see the disease popping up in some of these port cities at first. This is where they hit the hardest because it was carried on ships to the rest of Europe at first. And so from there, you just you just see it expanding outward. Um, so you see that southern, southern Europe was largely hit first. Uh, and then from there, it starts moving west and north. Um, tremendous loss of life. So you can also see that there were some pockets where people were largely unaffected. Uh, there really weren't very many deaths. Poland is an area that didn't suffer very much. Uh, some scholars think that was because it was uh, fairly isolated. It was mountainous and you didn't see a lot of interaction with with other groups. Um, I haven't seen any alternative explanations for that, but that's largely the the one that has been accepted by scholars. Uh, and then, of course, M Milan. <clears throat> Milan is is also kind of in a mountainous area, um, but I think M Milan. One of the reasons why Milan uh, escaped it is they cornered themselves fairly early in in the epidemic, and and so. You know, I, I can't tell you for sure that that's why they were able to escape it, but that's one theory. That's one theory for why uh, Milan was able to escape the worst of it. Um, and so we just have sort of these few little pockets. It's interesting because you can see in the mountains between Spain and France that there was a pocket as well that escaped the, the disease for the most part. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of of how you know what the trajectory of the disease look like so now we're going to move on and take a look at some artwork that we have uh, coming out of this time period this is a piece called the dance of death um, it's a really great piece you can see that it was painted on a wall it's it's some kind of mural I, I don't know what the materials are exactly it looks like some kind of fresco or something um, but it's pretty well preserved and it gives us a pretty good idea of of what it was that people were concerned with, you know, and how this art is developing. Now, this is displayed on the wall of a church, and and some art historians have have believed that this piece is expressing this message that everyone must be pious and faithful in this life because the afterlife will bring either heaven or 
um, or hell. And your social standing doesn't matter because look who's in this painting. You have what looks like a king. Uh, you have a queen. You have um, to the left someone who's a merchant. So these are presumably people who have some wealth and some social standing. And so the implication is, is that your social status isn't going to save you. <clears throat> and so uh, it, it just gives us a good, good look at, at um, you know, how these messages were being conveyed by the church to, to Christians throughout Europe. <clears throat> Here's another piece. Uh, this was around 1300 um, and so this is the procession of St. Gregory. Gregory was the Pope at the time and you can see that this is really kind of a disturbing image because you can see that the Pope is is sort of making these supplications and and it's not necessarily helping um, you know this was kind of a this would have been a fearful image to take a look at because behind him you can see that people are still dying. Uh, you you can see that even a churchman is on the is on the ground. So uh, people were fearful. I you know you you sort of have you have individuals that turn to piety as a way of sort of they believed that if they were more pious they could stave off the effects of this disease. In fact. Uh, we have this this movement that develops in in Europe called the flagellants, in which uh, people actually uh, whipped themselves. And the idea was they were doing penance for the community, and if they could just do it enough, then uh, then things would be okay. Now this is an example of tomb art and you can see that the date on this is 1547 and I bring this in because you know even though the Black Death itself at least at its height was at an earlier time period and was followed by cycles of plague it's I, in fact I you know I do believe that the plague itself continued to rear its head well into the 17th century. So this is an ongoing cycle of death. Uh, now, of course, it was no n nowhere near as deadly as it had been in that first wave, um, probably because people were developing immunity. Um, but we can see from this, this is a good example of this tomb art that we see in which, you know, instead of, of people being portrayed in these pious poses, you have depictions of rotting corpses. Um, so this this artwork is is continuing even into the 16th century and beyond. Um, it's it's really influential. Goodness, I you know a few years ago, even on children's clothing, you were finding skeletons on on children's clothing. So it's just really interesting how we continue to see these images pop up every so often. It's still having an impact on our society today. Okay, so this image is a little bit different from the ones I just showed you. The The prior ones would have been images that, um, you know, would be on churches or tombs or um, they would have been geared more towards um, elites possibly. They, they were definitely oftentimes for a particular segment of the population, but woodcuts were extremely popular during the day. Think about this. Most people were illiterate. Most people couldn't read, and so one of the ways that messages were conveyed were through woodcuts. And and the way that woodcuts worked is that an artist would carve an image into a piece of wood, into a flat piece of wood, and you would then put ink over that image, um, and then press it into paper, and it would transfer the image to the paper. And this was so efficient that you could really you could you could print thousands of these little leaflets and spread them around. In fact, woodcuts are so popular that they're really going to be instrumental during the Protestant Reformation in spreading the message of Protestants and the message of reform. So uh, this one in particular, uh, remember I, I talked about the, the danse macabre. Uh, this is a good example of how that, that was reflected in art. And so we have this image of dancing skeletons, and you have the skeleton on the left who's playing music, 
And this is a fresh grave. This is somebody who has just died, and they're coming to get them. And the message is, is you're going to die. Uh, no matter what you do, this is where you're going to end up. And so it's not a terribly pleasant image, and, and maybe it's even a little bit morbid, but think about the time period that people are living in. Here's another great, uh, a couple of images um, that I wanted to show you. On the left, this would have been a, a doctor's costume. And the idea is, uh, you might have seen this image before, uh, but this was, this was sort of a doctor's plague costume. Uh, people of, from that time period believed that disease was spread through smell. That it was that it was fumes, uh, smell, um, the odors of the air, that caused disease, and so that was the contagion. They didn't understand about bacteria or viruses or any of these really microscopic things. They thought it was the these vapors, and so if you were a plague doctor, if you were a doctor during these plague years and the plague was going around, um, and and really a lot of diseases for that matter, but if there were a contagious disease, uh, the long beak, you would put uh, sweet-smelling herbs, things like that, inside of that beak. And it protected, supposedly, it protected the doctor from inhaling any of these contagions. Um, and so presumably he would be able to go about his business and help people without having to worry about becoming sick. But of course we know that doctors in particular were, were at risk for catching the plague and were, were by no means spared. But this, this reflects what the understanding of the day was concerning pathology, the pathology of a disease. The, the right image, uh, it, it really is a sad image because you can see that you've got this skeleton and he's come to take this child away and you can see the look on the mother's face. I, they were about daily activities and all of a sudden this child is snatched away from her and you just, you can just see how, um, kind of devastating. It's really kind of an emotional, an emotional picture. Um, one of the things that we see happening during the the Black Death is that we see uh, that a lot of Jewish populations, Jewish communities are being scapegoated. Remember the blood libel that I talked about. Um, communities, when they were um, in the throes of this disease, were looking for someone to blame. And Jews were an easy target. They just, they were vulnerable. They, you know, um, it's really unfortunate, it's really sad, but people in trying to find someone to blame, like I said, if you recall in that last lecture that I talked about the Inquisition and how the Inquisition is becoming more widespread and there's this hardening of, of church, um, the church's position on heresy, uh, this particularly impacted Jewish populations. And so this this particular woodcut is depicting the burning of Jews in Cologne. That that is a city and it's in Germany today. I believe that is a city that um has been wrestled over between between France and Germany. Don't quote me on that, but um in Germany the city is Köln. It's K O L N. Uh, so if you see that, this is the same city. Um, and you can see the date on this. This is 1493. Um, this would have been, this is one of those images that was used to spread news of something, to spread news of an, of an event. And so these leaflets with this image would have been, uh, passed around. And, um, to the extent that this is how people learned that there was this burning of Jews in Colonia. And unfortunately, images like this kind of helped. Um, in, they, they worked sometimes to inspire people to ta take action of their own. So sometimes they could instigate further violence. So again, this image is, is kind of after, this is quite a bit after the, um, the height, the the worst of the Black Death, but I show it to you because this this goes to show that even more than 150 years uh, after the the height of the plague, uh, let me check my date on that. Um, you know, a long time after the a century and a half after the height 
of the Black Death, uh, people are still looking for someone to blame. They're still looking for answers about why these cycles of disease are continuing to visit them. Um, and just to show you the influence that the, the Black Death is having on art, this is a good example of a piece that is, is depicting rather horrific scenes. This is called The Triumph of Death, and it was painted by Pieter Bruegel, the elder. Um, it's, if you, it's, this isn't super high resolution on this image. If you ever get the chance, this is actually um, in a museum called the Prado in, in Madrid, Spain. And it hangs directly across from another painting by an artist named Bosch called The Garden of Earthly De Delights, which is an interesting it's interesting that it, those two are hung together because the Garden of Earthly Delights depicts, uh, scholars kind of differ over whether it depicts um, sort of, you know, paradise lost or if it's depicting those things that lead a person to be lost. Um, scholars differ on that. But it's really interesting that you have this depiction of um, sort of people giving in to their passions and you know there's it, it's it looks very green and it looks very paradisiacal and all this stuff but um, it's hanging right across the the room from the triumph of death so it's just kind of interesting that you have these two together um, this painting is usually dated to around 1562 and it it really is one of the most terrifying paintings of the age to the extent that we don't really see anything as uh, graphic as this until we get to the artist Goya in 1810, around 1820, when he painted The Disasters of War. So this is literally hell on earth. This is a painting of hell on earth. Um, It's it's actually um, some some scholars think of it as maybe an allegory. So you know Europeans were real big on on dis depicting things in word and in picture using allegory, so that you had to interpret it, and there were many levels to it. Um, Bruegel's message in this painting seems pretty clear. It seems pretty clear that what he's saying is that there really is no escape from the scourge of war. And we're going to talk about this next uh, the, with the Hundred Years' War. Between the plague and the Hundred Years' War, Europe is devastated. This was, um, this was crushing to most of Europe. And so kind of some of the things that you see in this is that we have men and women in this landscape who are trying to fend off death, death's henchmen with sword and spear. This is a battle between the living and the dead. But the living are badly outnumbered. There's more dead than there are living, and their efforts are futile. So death is inevitable, and it doesn't spare anyone in society regardless of status. This was a lesson that medieval and Renaissance artists really never tired of teaching their audiences. Uh, with the Black Death, this becomes really prevalent um, core message of art for quite some time. But in turn, death is is the way that death is depicted becomes a, a vehicle for a lot of creativity as well. There's, if you look at it, death itself is creative. Uh, there's a variety of tortures being depicted in this in this work. Uh, lots of different tortures. Um, some examples. Uh, it's you know it's pretty chaotic and it's pretty destructive. But you know some of the things to look for is that I, there's not really a center to this battle. But in the foreground, there's a skeleton that is cutting a man's throat. Um, so look for that. And not far away from that skeleton, there's actually a starving dog eating a woman's face. Um, on a hillside further back on the right, there's a dead man who's been skinned and hung from a tree. 
and I apologize for the resolution of this image. I wish I could get it a higher resolution image and still be able to uh, upload this video. So if you want to see this um, in a better image, try going online and searching out the original image and see if you can find a better image of this. But the, the man who has been skinned and hung from a tree, his head is actually thrown backward and he's held in the branches by a metal pin that passes through his skull. In the vicinity, there's a man that hangs from a gallows, and he's actually being watched by onlookers. There are a few inches, a few inches to the right, there's also a man on his knees who is about to be decapitated. There's also lots of victims who are impaled on on uh, spoked wheels that sit atop poles. Right, lots of different ways to die. And on top of this, the dead are advancing on on these outnumbered humans, on the outnumbered living, and they're holding coffin lids as shields. Notice that. And these shields are, are emblazoned with the sign of the cross. Now this is really interesting because for the most part, if you look at this image, there is no hope. There's no hope of salvation in Christ being depicted here, is there? This is very different from, from no, most depictions of death and the afterlife that you've seen in prior eras. Um, salvation through Christ is not the point of this of this message. This is this is pretty this is a pretty hopeless picture. And so this this work of art is actually a very popular piece for uh, museum visitors in Spain, uh, visitors to the Prado Museum in Spain. Uh, people really like to kind of sit there and take a look at what's going on and look at all the various ways that people are dying. But, you know, the message of this painting is pretty clear that death is unstoppable. There are many ways to die, and it's, it's rather hopeless. Um, in fact, if you look in the left upright corner, there is a... Uh, Skele there are skeletons ringing a bell, and that's a really interesting image because normally when you see bells, uh, bells were were a way that Christians um, uh, signaled messages of hope. You know, the idea was ring the bell, church is beginning. You're going to hear, you're you're coming into the church, and this is how you get salvation. Salvation is through Jesus and through the church, and so. Uh, They've, he's he's played on this imagery that is that is a fairly common thing that Christians of that time period would have it would have resonated with them it would have disturbed them to see it being flipped in that way. Um, this really is it's mocking nihilism. It's just uh, playing on all of these images that would have would have hit home. All right, so moving on from that fun topic, uh, hopefully you're not too too depressed after talking about the Black Death and looking at all that really hor horrific artwork. Um, we're going to talk about the Hundred Years' War, and this is a this is um, another one of those crises, those these disastrous events that happens, and so it's good to kind of know uh, the players. Um, and so this is giving you. An idea of the Valois succession. These were the kings of France, and and how everybody was related together. And so, if you keep that keep, if you haven't already printed off the slide for this, you know, keep that in front of you so you can you can reference it. <clears throat> now, in 1337, uh, Philip the Sixth of France uh, claimed a region called Guyenne. This was an area around Bordeaux, and it was part of the continent still held by the English monarchs. So remember, we have English monarchs who are holding uh, vast lands on the continent. Now, in return, <clears throat> Edward III of England, his response was to claim the French throne. So Philip VI claims some of, some of the English monarchy's lands, and the English monarch in Edward III turns around and says, oh, but that French throne is mine. And this touches off a century of war and conflict. The war had two phases. In the first phase, uh, this phase climaxed in 1415 at the Battle of Agincourt. Uh, England gained territory and established the Duchy of, of Burgundy. In the second phase, 
the French recovered and reconquered nearly all of England's continental territory. French success was partially due to Joan of Arc. So you've probably heard of Joan of Arc. She's a very famous figure. She was a 16-year-old peasant girl who claimed to have visions in which God told her to fight against the English. Now, Joan of Arc fought courageously in the successful Battle of Orléans and convinced the French Dauphin to travel to the cathedral and Reims to be appointed, to be anointed and crowned King Charles VII by um, the church there. In 1431, there was a failed attempt to take Paris, and Joan was captured. Uh, she was turned over to the English and burned at the stake after being tried as a witch. And so she kind of fell victim to some internal struggles between the French, the French monarchy and Burgundians and others who were um, not, they, they were not necessarily allies with the French monarch. Other Europeans became involved in the war. And both sides, both uh, the continental side and the English side, made a lot of use of mercenaries. It was a pop. It was a really uh, efficient way of um, filling out your troops. Burgundy uh, played both sides against each other before siding with France in 1435. But again, not before Joan was captured and turned over to the English. And eventually, Burgundy was actually uh, absorbed into France. Although many considered the war, the Hundred Years' War, a chivalric adventure, in fact, you'll, you'll see literature from the time idealizing this, this war, most of the soldiers who fought in it were mercenaries or free companies. They were not knights in the traditional sense. And these companies, these free companies, lived off the land at times. And you can imagine the effect on the population because they extorted protection money from peasants. This was per particularly hard on peasants. So it wasn't just that uh, you, you need a lot of resources to fight a war, but the, the, uh, the mercenaries were actually uh, taking, they were stealing money from um, from peasants and things got so bad that there was rampant rape throughout the countryside in these areas where the war was being fought. Archers and foot soldiers were more important in the conflict than knights and cannon and gunpowder weapons became more important as the war continued. So we see the influence of technology, of, of new technology, new weapons and the destructive nature of this war. Armies became increasingly professionalized and centralized, as you can imagine, after such extended warfare. Unfortunately, Europe got really good at fighting war. Now, there was widespread resentment among the common people of France and England because of this war. Uh, they were paying a lot of taxes, and the taxes kept going up. And, and the tax, tax monies were going towards supporting this Hundred Years' War rather than uh, for society. These weren't, they're, you know, just imagine how you would feel if you were a peasant and you're getting taxed like crazy to support a war over, over some monarchy's territories. So this fueled a lot of uprisings. There, there were a number of peasant revolts during the time period, and these in turn contributed to further political and social disorder, widespread effects. In 1338, the war led to pro-English rebellions in Flemish cities and towns. These were actually put down in 1348, but some revolts continued nevertheless. For example, there was a Parisian revolt in 1358 against high taxes and incompetent leadership. And so it was, it was put down and its leader was assassinated, but nevertheless, you can see that uh, peasants themselves are becoming more and more comfortable with this idea of revolt. <clears throat> the same year as the Parisian Revolt, uh, which, by the way, was branded the Jacquerie, and if you go on to study uh, Western Civilizations too, you'll see that term uh, come up again in the French Revolution. Um, it was called the Jacquerie by disgusted elites, so this was by no means a complimentary term. Uh, the... <clears throat> 
the so sorry i i lost my train of thought a little bit but here we go so this peasant revolt called the jacquerie um it was really brutally repressed and it left a lot of peasants with a bad taste in their mouth and left them feeling quite resentful so keep that in mind <clears throat> in england uh we also have the passage of a poll tax in 1381 that triggered a peasant revolt known as Watt Tyler's Rebellion. And if you watched the video that I sh that I put up on Blackboard of uh, called the Peasant, it's a just an episode in in a series of documentaries done by um, or, sorry a series uh, a documentary series called Medieval Lives by Terry Jones. You some of you may know him from. Um, from Monty Python, um, it, it, there's a good depiction in there of Watt Tyler's Rebellion, so pay attention to that if you need to go back and review it. It's it's kind of a great look at the impact of, of such a rebellion. So the rebels in Watt Tyler's Rebellion demanded, among other things, an end to serfdom. And they marched on London before the rebellion was put down, and its leaders uh, its leaders were executed. So they weren't quite successful in getting what they wanted because, um, you know, ultimately the the elites were able to put down this rebellion, but and and of course assassinate Watt Tyler. But it's important because these rebels are are coming to the realization that they want freedom they want something different than what they have and they're willing to lose their lives for it and this is a revolutionary idea because serfdom has existed for centuries so just a map of uh, that shows you sort of the progress of of the hundred years war um, in the map on the right you you can see how much of the continent the English owned and then in the middle map you can see that stage of the war in which the English took a lot of those French territories. Um, and then to the right uh, you see the phase of the war in which the French took a lot of those territories back and then some. They took pretty much all, all the territories that the English, the English held on the continent. So let's briefly talk about uh, the Ottoman conquest <clears throat> because this is going on at the same time as some of these some of these events. Now the Ottomans were a Central Asian tribe who began to expand under Osman the uh, First. He reigned from 1280 to 1324, and he actually waged holy war against unbelievers. Then we have Murad the first he reigned from 1360 to 1389 uh, and he is known for reducing um, the the Ottomans under Murad the first are they are known for reducing the Byzantine Empire to Constantinople and vassal state status the Ottomans also expanded into the Balkans and across Anatolia so this would be that area that we know of today as as part of Turkey at the 1389 Battle of Kosovo, uh, Kosovo should be a familiar, perhaps, I hope so, Kosovo should be a familiar city to you. Uh, we had a UN peacekeeping mission to Kosovo in uh, the 1990s that, that was important. And in fact, um, some of the reasons for that conflict uh, between Serbians and Croatians is rooted in this time period. So we have the Battle of Kosovo, and Murad uh, I of the Ottomans defeated a Hungarian-Serbian army. Ottoman conquest resumed after a pause during the reign of Mehmed II. Uh, he reigned from 1451 to 1481, uh, and he was resolved to take Constantinople. In 1453, the city fell when cannons breached its walls and the Byzantine Emperor was beheaded and this marked the end of the Byzantine Empire so it's an important event to note uh, Mehmed sought to become a successor to the Roman emperors interestingly enough he turned Justinian's Hagia Sophia church into a mosque this is the period in which it became a mosque he kept the name Constantinople but the city was popularly referred to as Istanbul 
uh, he requisitioned Christian boys. Um, they were converted and trained as soldiers, and they served as what became known as Janissaries. And their function was to defend and administer formerly Byzantine regions. So the idea here is to get the local population involved in their own rule. Much more effective way to manage uh, subjugated populations. Mehmed uh, expanded the empire through Serbia by 1458 and conquered Athens and the Peloponnese by 1460. He gained Bosnia six, six years later. By 1500, the Ottoman state bridged Europe and the Middle East. And so I hope that kind of gives you some background for some of the conflicts that we see in Eastern Europe still today even, oftentimes being divided along religious lines and, and often rooted in this, in this earlier period. All right, so back over to what's going on in Europe. Another interesting develop that, development that we have going on during this time period that was really uh, a difficult time for um, Europeans all around occurred with the Great Schism. <clears throat> now, if you'll recall, the popes had moved to Avignon um, as they lost control over Rome. And this removal of the popes to Avignon from Rome produced a lot of criticism Critics of the papacy emerged, such as the English Franciscan William of Ockham, who argued that the faithful were more important to the church than the papacy or church councils. This is a revolutionary idea, because he's saying that, that it's the body of the church that is important, not these so-called, um, to him, what would have been to him, these, these churchmen, these uh, peripheral figures. Now, Pope Gregory XI, uh, he was the Pope from 1370 to 1378. He responded to critics uh, and returned to Rome in 1377. After his death, uh, an Italian came to the papacy. He was, he was known as Urban VI, and he was chosen as, as Gregory XI's successor. Now, <laughs> this is one of the interesting events of this century. Urban's goal was to curb the power of the cardinals. Uh, he wanted to make the papacy stronger and have have the cardinals uh, be exerting less authority, less power over the affairs of the church and its administration. And so in response to some of his moves to curb their power, uh, some of them actually elected a French pope. Uh, he was called Clement the Seventh, and they installed him at Avignon. Okay. Now, Clément and Urban excommunicated each other, and this caused what we know today of as the Great Schism. Clément was supported by the French king, while the king of England supported Urban. So you can see that kings are getting involved here, and this is becoming a much bigger event um, with the involvement of, of these monarchies. And it wasn't just Fran France and England, but there were other states involved. There was a lot of forming of alliances and a lot of switching of sides depending on perceptions of how uh, a state might benefit, how a nation might benefit. The more gain, uh, you know, oftentimes you would choose a side based on what you would get out of it. Now, many argued that a church council was needed to resolve this dispute, that it wasn't going to fix itself on its own. In 1409, with the successor popes in power uh, refusing to attend, they didn't recognize the authority of this, uh, the cardinals who were loyal to neither pope met in a council and they elected a new pope. This meant three popes. The Council of Constance, which met between 1414 and 1418, met to resolve this papal crisis and institute reforms. I, you know, can you imagine three popes, three, three leaders of, of Christianity? <clears throat> All three popes resigned or were deposed. So they managed to kind of get, get these three popes out. And this Council of Constance elected Martin V as pope to replace them. And he was recognized by every significant ruler effectively ending the schism, there was a recognition that uh, 
you know, this this wasn't really good for anybody. Uh, so I actually should have showed you this map when I talked about the Ottoman expansion, but uh, just take a look at it. This gives you an idea of what the Ottoman Empire looked like at various times and how it was expanding over into Eastern uh, Europe. It's kind of straddling both continents. And you can also see in the sort of star, those star, those little burgundy stars, um, where some of the ma major battles were fought. Uh, Kosovo in 1389. Um, you know, I don't know what battle that is in 1364, but we have the Battle of Constantinople in 1453, in which the Ottomans were able to take control of those areas and um, and set about to establish an Ottoman state from that point on. All right, so, you know, like I said, I have these, these slides a little bit backwards, uh, back to the Great Schism. Um, now, it's important to put the Great Schism in context because when the Great Schism occurred, it was happening about the same time as one of the cycles of plague. And so the plague is continuing in Europe and the church is in crisis. And as a result of this, we get the development of new forms of piety. New forms of piety are emerging and becoming popular, popular ways to express faith. And, you know, of course, to appeal to God. Uh, the pious sought to ensure their salvation through plenary indulgence. This was a full forgiveness of sin. And this is going to become an issue in the Reformation because those indulgences often, what began to happen is that these indulgences became a vehicle to earn money for, for some churchmen. And it became seen as, as a very corrupt practice. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that was going on during this time period that we're talking about here is that these, these indulgences, these plenary indulgences, were for those who made pilgrimages to designated holy places. So if you made a pilgrimage, you would get an indulgence. Uh, and, and we did see that during the Crusades as well, that, you know, a crusade was kind of a form of a pilgrimage, a militarized version, of course, but it was a form of, of pilgrimage. And you too, if you went on crusade, could could receive indulgences. And essentially what indulgences did was they reduced the amount of time that you would spend in purgatory. Uh, you purchased indulgences or you earned them by certain devout acts and you decreased the amount of time that you spent in purgatory so you could go to heaven sooner. Now, education was strengthened um, in the development of these new forms of piety, and more schools were established. Uh, people were looking for ways to to learn, to seek knowledge. And priests were instructed to teach the faithful the basics of religion. So we even see, <coughs> excuse me, a reform of, of priestly training. So if you're a priest, you... you um, the idea was to give them a little bit more education so that they could actually be more helpful to um, to their people. There were a range of popular devotions that proliferated in homes. And so private expressions of piety became very popular as well. Uh, public pop processions of the Eucharist and images of the suffering Christ became widespread as well. And so it wasn't just a matter of going to a church to receive the Eucharist, but you would see these these processions that that um, developed that responded to this. And so the idea is you participate in this procession, go, um, you, you're signifying that you are participating in the Eucharist. <clears throat> now, what we also see happening, though, is that we get new heretical movements. And these heretical movements emerged out of religious anxiety as well as dissent and social unrest. So again, you know, people in the, during the Black Death were really questioning um, what was going on. They, they really were feeling like everything that they thought was true may not be. And so this is leading to, this is leading to, um, just people being in a state of anxiety and and less willing just to accept the status quo. 
So we do see a lot of dissent and unrest resulting from this. In England, uh, a man named John Wycliffe, he was a churchman, um, and he lived between 1330 and 1384, so he is 14th century. Uh, he was sort of the founder. He inspired or inspired what was called the Lollard Movement. Uh, this this movement emphasized Bible readings and preached against monasticism. They saw monasticism as as a corruption, um, and they saw it as being an institution that that bred corruption and fostered corruption. Um, and they also preached against corruption in in other institutions in the church as well. So it wasn't just the the monasteries and the nunneries that they were preaching against, but they were preaching against corruption in the church and in the mass as well. The idea was, you know, what they saw were modifications that had crept in over the years, over the centuries, and and so they questioned the legitimacy of that. The Lollards were really active, and they actually included many women, but they were widely persecuted. We also have another group called the Hussites. Uh, they were primarily in Bohemia. In, Bohemia is located in what is today the Czech Republic. Um, after World War II, the region of Bohemia was, was um, included in Czechoslovakia, in the formation of Czechoslovakia. So that just kind of gives you some context for the area that we're talking about. But in Bohemia, we have the Hussites, and they were led by Jan Hus. Uh, he, we think maybe he uh, was born around 1372, and he died in 1415. He was actually an admirer of Wycliffe, heavily influenced by him. Uh, the Hussites in general insisted on equal dignity of the laity and the right of the people to receive the wine as well as the bread at Eucharist. And so they were arguing that the body of the church was not of lesser status than those who prayed for the body of the church. Uh, and they were also arguing for accessibility of the Eucharist. So by this time in church history, uh, in general, people didn't receive the wine, they only received the bread. The priest drank the wine on behalf of the congregation. And so the Hussites are arguing that, that all believers, that, that Christians, should receive both. Uh, Hus was actually uh, condemned. He was arrested. Um, he was condemned as a heretic, and in order to arrest him, the church lured him, the church in the area lured him to, they invited him to this Council of Constance uh, that I spoke of earlier, and he went expecting that he was going to be heard. That was the that was the invitation that was given to him, but when he arrived, he was actually arrested and spent some time in jail, and so we actually have some of his writings that have survived from this period in which he was imprisoned, but ultimately he was executed. Now, his outraged Czech supporters, his outraged Bohemian supporters, revolted against German rule because, remember, this area is controlled by the Germans at the time. And so <clears throat> they actually, uh, the, the church called several crusades against them, but they were, the, the Czechs were successful in defeating those crusades, at least for a time. And they established several communities where radicals attempted to live according to the example of the first apostles. And so these were sort of, uh, these were some of those groups that would talk about uh, the primitive church going back to the time of Jesus and, and reconstructing that primitive church. They negotiated with the Holy Roman Emperor and were eventually incorporated into the Bohemian system. Uh, but they won the right to receive communion in both kinds, and they, it, this effort actually strengthened Czech identity and became the basis, uh, part of the basis for Czech identity. So it's interesting how you can have religious expressions that lead to this, these more somewhat nationalistic identities. Um, although we, we're not really getting into nationalism in this course. Now, we have this famous work that has survived from this period, and it's called the Book of Hours. And the Book of Hours essentially just depicts uh, these very idealized scenes from peasant life. And 
So, you know, if you were elite, the, this would definitely not be something that a peasant could afford because it's got lots of colors. This would have been very expensive to reproduce. And so this is definitely intended for, for a more elite audience. So that should give you some clues as to how much you can rely on these images as a an actual depiction of peasant life. Because it's very idealized. There's lots of color to it. It sure looks like they're having a good time, doesn't it? I You know, it looks like so much fun to... to um, to rake up hay uh, and harvest crops um, by hand so it looks very idealized it's also but it's it's a beautiful work because you see a lot of fineness in the detail uh, there's a lot of images in this particular book in, in, in the book of hours and uh, you can see in this particular work you can see actually in the background you can see a palace you can also see really intricate uh, Gothic cathedral back there <clears throat> and the people themselves are depicted as really these kind of graceful individuals there you can imagine that they were just beautiful people right um, but this this work kind of gives us a clue that this was a commissioned work and it was commissioned by somebody who was from the nobility or or at the very least someone who was really wealthy now like I said, this should give you a clue that this isn't really a particularly realistic work. Um, it doesn't, it just seems like it, it's got a very fairy tale quality to it. And it doesn't give you any sense of the difficulty of living during this time, particularly for peasants who usually suffered from malnutrition because of, um, you know, the difficulties in the food supply during this time period. So, uh, very idealized, but it's an interesting to it's interesting to look at it, nevertheless. And another map, just one one last map here. Um, this is a map of that area that I was talking about, um, in which we find the Hussites. Uh, part of this would have been um, Czechoslovakia in post World War II. Um, and so you can see Poland and Hungary to the right, Holy Roman Empire to the left. So that just kind of gives you an idea of the geography of the area.